All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about electrical and computer engineering and what are the differences between the two. All right, so there are many different types of electrical and computer engineers, so I want to get into the different disciplines and different uh, kind of job opportunities in both of those. Uh, talk about what industries they work in and then talk about some of those technical divisions that exist in there. So, you know, what sort of things can you be designing or working on as an electrical or computer engineer? So what does a electrical engineer actually do? Let's start with electrical engineering. This is uh, big, big ideas. Uh, a big part of it is designing and developing electrical circuits. This might take some prototyping. Usually it's a lot of design work. Um, what does it look like to design digital controls? Talk about instrumentation. Uh, signal processing is also huge. There's a lot of telecommunications that goes around. What does it mean to, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, power distribution is a really big part of electrical engineering as well. And then uh, for some electrical engineers, you might be getting into more biomedical applications. So biomedical, we talked a little bit about when we talked about mechanical engineering, but also there's electrical applications for uh, biomedic for electrical engineering as well. So what are those? What is that in biomed medical situation? So let's first talk about some circuits. Um, circuits are, uh, can be very simple, like the ones that we're doing with Arduinos, and sometimes they're very complicated. Uh, there are very small circuits and very large circuits. Um, for large circuits, you can think of power grids as very large circuits. Um, our wiring plans for a building is a very large circuit. Um, all of these things need a engineer to look at these and make sure that they're designed to meet capacity, decide what design, what criteria we need to meet and how to meet those with uh, safely and economically, right? Um, Digital controls are becoming more and more popular as the technologies get a lot cheaper. Uh, microcontrollers used to be very expensive. Now you can buy them for pennies, uh, not the, uh, on a production scale. You can buy them for pennies instead of, uh, they used to be, you know, hundreds of dollars sometimes. So this is really cool. That means that we can make, uh, take a lot of big clunky mechanical controls and make them into small, digital controls and send those signals anywhere using uh, electrical signals, either over a wire or uh, even uh, using radio technology, right? So uh, electrical controls are used in all sorts of industries, uh, industrial and manufacturing, right? The cool thing about these things is they can make corrections really quickly and accurately. accurately. Um, designers that work in this field need to figure out what sort of things we want to control, what are the parameters that we're looking at and monitoring, and then how fast do we want to make those measurements and make corrections. Um, sometimes quick reactions are not actually what we want. A lot of students think, hey, faster is better, but sometimes making slower, fewer corrections is actually better for the process. So there's a certain level of understanding that process that goes into this design of digital controls. Um, at the Newcore steel plant, remember when I showed you some of those pictures, uh, the Newcore steel plant is all digitally controlled. So sitting at the control uh, desk, you, all they're seeing is a computer monitor, right? All of these are digital controls that are connected through that uh, digital system. Um, this is also used a lot in chemical manufacturing. Uh, also power plants use digital controls, manufacturing, Automotive manufacturing and airplane manufacturing also use a lot of digital controls. We're seeing uh, these become more and more um, popular. And also in the in the uh, vehicles themselves, right? Cars are mostly computer controlled now. Even what we're seeing as it used to be automatic transmissions were mechanically automatic, but now we're seeing more and more of those transmissions actually are uh, shifted. They're mechanical shifted, just like a using clutches and all the same things that we use for a manual transmission. But instead of a human doing it, there is a robot 
the computer is actually doing those shifts at the right times, which is pretty cool. Signal processing is a huge portion of this. Communi telecommunication is, a, is, you know, a billions and billions of dollars every year. So uh, signal processing is a big part of that, right? Whenever you send any sort of signal for any distance, you're gonna get some noise and filtering, amplifying, and modifying those electrical signals is what signal processing is all about. So there's some math in there, but there's also the designs of those circuits to do that work. Um, communications is huge. If you're an audio nerd, right? Signal processing is a big part of audio. And there's all sorts of medical applications for being able to read signals. Um, many of our really uh, advanced um, scans like a CAT scan or MRI are using uh, little tiny signals and being able to read those accurately and filter out the noise is a really big part of that process. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit about biomedical applications. So electrical uh, circuits are a big part of biomedical devices. So there's those things. There's also Imaging is a big part of it, right? We talked about a little bit about MRIs and CAT scans. Both of these are non-obtrusive, which means non-intrusive, which means we don't have to cut anybody open to do this imaging. Um, there's also embedded devices that we uh, use to enhance people's quality of life. Um, things like pacemakers and cardiac monitors are huge for people that have uh, cardiovascular issues. Um, prosthetics are really uh, a big part of that as well. Um, so if you're working on something with uh, sensors or feedback, uh, nerve feedback, you know, that's where we'd see these sort of electrical applications. And a big one for anybody who has diabetes, uh, insulin pumps, right? This is a really, really cool uh, device that uh, can, makes things of quality of life a lot better. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what, about, uh, what about hearing aids? Oh yeah, hearing aids, I definitely would put in this category too, right? And I would say in hearing aids, there's also a little bit of signal amplification, right? And uh, filtering, you might wanna make sure that the hearing aid isn't picking up electrical buzz or radio signals or any of that sort of thing. So there's a fair amount of signal processing that's also tied into that. Yeah, that's a great a question. Absolutely. Uh, is it true that hearing it actually can pick up like radio stations uh, because uh, you could actually hear like radio stations with those hearing aids and stuff i don't know i i don't have any experience with that but it doesn't sound very far-fetched to me um a lot of uh from my experience with working with amateur radio um it's very easy to make a circuit uh to make a radio receiver accidentally and all you need is a couple of very simple electrical components to do that. Um, and hearing aids are very complex devices actually, um, and they're quite expensive. So the idea that it could you know, easily modify it or accidentally pick up radio stations, absolutely. But I, I don't have any experience with that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's talk about power generation and transmission. So. Uh, a lot of students don't realize this, but almost all electricity that we look that we generate is built off of something that's spinning. Um, that's what a generator does. It translates rotational energy into electric energy. So uh, if you think about that motor, uh, or you think about a generator, that's it. And you know, there's lots of different ways to make that spinny bit. Usually what we do is we make steam and then the steam drives our uh, generator using a turbine. Uh, and there's lots of ways to make heat. The most common way is uh, burning things, uh, but you can also use radioactivity to do that. You could also spin it. We're using water, that's, hydro uh, that's using a dam, something like that. Um, so power generation is a huge part of it. And there's uh, some fun, fun things that we do when we generate power and we transmit power. Uh, a lot of these things are creating 
uh, super high voltage system. So when we generate power and we transmit it, we actually transmit it at very, very high voltages, um, much higher than the 220, 240, or 120 volts that we see in our sockets. Um, there's lots of bits about this, but losses are a big part of it. Um, so a uh, big part of this, if you're going into transmission power generation or transmission, if you're working for a utility company, for instance, you're going to be looking at how to most efficiently transmit these things and reduce those energy losses, right? If we lose energy in transmission, the cost of delivery is higher. Um, there's also some material science around this. There's some uh, experiment, a lot of experiments going around around superconductivity. How do we reduce the amount of resistance and increase the amount of power that actually gets to our uh, box? So this is the idea here. Um, this is kind of an old sketch, but this is, if you think about it, there's actually uh, for for most uh, houses somewhere on your block, you're going to see a transformer that steps down the 600 volts down into that 240 or 120 volts that you use to power your house. Um, and there's really kind of a plus and a minus and then a neutral, sorry, a plus and a minus and a yeah, neutral that comes out of here. But how, but, but that's a big part of it is, is that power generation and transmission. All right. Now, just like there's the ASE and the ASME to, for, as a professional organization for uh, mechanical and civil engineers, there's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. That's the IEEE, as we often call them. And this is one of the, this is actually the largest professional organization of engineers in the US. Um, the cool thing about joining one of these professional organizations is that you get a lot of professional and legal support for your members. So if you're a member of one of these organizations, right, you're part of kind of a, uh, almost like a union of engineers that work together and they help develop the codes and uh, can help you out if you're having any sort of professional or legal problems, they can be a great support network for that. Um, also, I found for me, when I was looking for a job, being a part of ASCE, the civil engineering version of this was really, really helpful. So it's a great networking opportunity. If you're looking for places to work or jobs, um, this is a great place to start. Um, there's lots of divisions, right? And I would call these, this is kind of a way to think about these as like technical aspects that you could focus on if you're a, a electrical or an electronics engineer. And I want to look at some of those in the next slide and kind of uh, peruse those a little bit and think about some ideas about what does that mean. There's a whole list of them. So 37 of these divisions. I'm not going to read them all out, but I want to pause here for a sec, take a look at this list. And let's think about things that are interesting or confusing or surprising on this list. So I'm just going to pause the recording for a bit. So some of the things we looked at today, we talked a little bit about consumer electronics and how that's a pretty broad field. There's things like coffee makers and uh, printers and all of the electronic devices that we have at our home probably fit into this consumer electronics in some way or another. Um, we talked a little bit about what a dielectric is. Um, a dielectric is a material that we use inside of our capacitor between the two plates to help us store more uh, power in that electric field. Um, you'll learn more about how capacitors do that in your physics two course. Uh, that's uh, physics 222. Um, we talked a little bit about some thing applications of neural networks and oceanic engineering, and then how we use electronics to help us in the geosynics uh, category. This is kind of an, a special industry application of, you know, designing earthquake or building health monitors to help us uh, record what's happening uh, in real time. All right, let's talk about some classes that electrical engineers take. 
Uh, physics series 221, 222, and 223 are really big. Um, for a lot of engineers, they take engineering statics. Electrical engineering has uh, a lot of the AC applications. If you get really good at the engineering 214 skills around uh, geometry and working with vectors, um, it really transfers really well into that circuits class. Um, I also say, if you have an idea of how statics works, it makes you a better electrical engineer when you work with mechanical engineers, because typically electrical and mechanical engineers uh, often work pretty closely in hand if you're working on a mechanical device that has any sort of electric components. And I would say that's a lot of things, cars, airplanes, uh, even smaller things. Uh, I have a friend of mine who works in designing antennas and he's a mechanical engineer. And he's like, what does he have to do with, uh, with antennas? But somebody has to build this case to protect the electronics inside. And the way that the electronics, the case is made has an effect on the electronics inside. What glues are used, what sort of processes are used to make these parts and how they're assembled. That's all mechanical engineering, but it's tied very closely to that electrical engineering. Um, off, often after that, so these yellow courses are things that you can take at South, and I highly suggest you do before you transfer, it will help you. Um, the other courses that you might, that you'll take often as an electrical engineer after you transfer are digital logic, which is kind of working with uh, yes and statements, or uh, digital logic is kind of using the electrical components to do uh, kind of basic logic diagramming and things like that. Circuit theory is all about helping you think about your designs and layouts. Um, there's lots of, there's a whole, whole list of courses that kind of fly around that. Um, power systems are something that students often take in their junior or senior year. And then specific courses around signal processing tend to be later in your educational career. All right, let's talk, uh, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about computer engineering. Now, I get this question all the time. What is computer engineering and what is computer science? Why do we have two terms that describe very similar things? What's the big difference here? So I put up some ideas on this um, and I hopefully this will be helpful to you. So computer science is all about the software. It's all about programming. Um, you're gonna be developing programs. You're gonna be focused on optimizing those programs. How do you build more efficient algorithms to do that work, right? Because most uh, most of our work, we want to uh, make automatic, right? So we're going to need to figure out what is the most effective way to do that. Um, how do we store our data in a more efficient manner so it takes up less space and it's easier for us to access? Um, and I would say a lot of this stuff is very high-level programming. It's far away from the from the hardware, right? That's what we mean, high level. On the other end of it, the other end of the spectrum, we have computer engineering. Computer programmers, they might know, they know some programming, but that's not their forte. Um, they focus a lot on the hardware or on the architecture. How do these things interact with, how does the hardware and the software mesh and work together, right? So they have a much better working understanding of the architecture of how these things work out. So they might work on things like computer uh, programming languages, uh, APIs, uh, which stands for, uh, which is how, you know, how we get programs to talk to each other, um, operating systems, right? How do we build things, uh, uh, the software that runs these things, drivers, things like that. They might help us develop specific computer electronics like modems, other interface devices like mice and keyboards and controllers and other kind of critical components around uh, hardware, right? Now, the reality is, is most engineers do a little bit of computer science and most computer scientists also know a little bit of computer engineering. So there's a little bit of flow in between these uh, groups here. Just keep that in mind. Uh, here are some computer engineering fields that I see a lot of. Security is a big one. You need to understand how the hardware works and how those operating systems work in order to make sure that you're eliminating security vulnerabilities. Uh, 
how do things network is, is a big one, network connectivity, AI, voice recognition systems. Uh, a lot of these use some AI actually. Uh, touch screens and other interface devices are kind of in this category. So these are some fields that you can go into if you're interested in computer engineering. There's a lot more. I'm just throwing out some ideas here. Um, here are some engineering courses that you can expect to take as a computer engineer. Um, programming languages, uh, the ones that we have at South are CSE 110, CSE 142, and 143. These are the kind of the uh, computer science major courses. Um, these are really important. Programming, uh, that Python course teaches you a lot about structures and how we program. And then Java 1 and 2. Java is a uh, proto language that I think a lot of people use um, to get into programming. It's uh, object based, so there's a lot of uh, applications for that. Um, in addition, you need to take a Math 220. That's a course that you take here at South. That's linear algebra. Linear algebra is uh, kind of goes into matrices and how we how computers do math is a big part of it. For a lot of students, thinking about that is a is a really really for me, even as somebody who's not doing a whole lot of programming, I think it's really fascinating to figure out how the computers are doing math and how we can leverage that. Uh, here at South, we also offer circuits. This is usually offered in the spring. Or it's always offered in the spring here at South. Um, that's a great course for you to kind of get your feet wet. So you do more advanced AC and or more advanced DC circuits, and then you get a little bit into alternating current, right? So we start talking about the math that's behind all of that. Uh, before that, you'll probably take physics 221, 222, and 23. Uh, and then later, you'll see some courses that we see in that electrical series, the digital logic and design, and then some more into signal conditioning, and probably a lot more into software architecture and how do we build these structures? How do they work with each other? All right, so that's a quick summary of the different types of electrical and computer engineers. Um, I talked a little bit about the difference between computer engineering and computer science. And I talked a little bit about those industries that you can expect to see these jobs in. We talked a little bit about some technical divisions of each of these. I'm gonna stop the recording here. And 